French typographer by the name of Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville brought his six-year-old daughter into a secret compartment behind his workshop in Paris. On a desk in the room stood a strange mechanical contraption he had spent many late nights working on. It consisted of an empty whiskey barrel connected to a membrane. The membrane connected to a stylus. The stylus trailed against a wheel covered in black paper. He told his daughter to put her face into the barrel and asked her to sing the same lullaby he would sang for her every night since she was born. As she sang, he slowly turned the wheel and the stylus traced a fine white line on the black paper. In 2008, an American researcher found a letter Martin Villa deposited at the French Academy of Sciences 148 years earlier. The letter begins with a question. Can it be hoped that the day is near when the melody will escape from the singer's lips and write itself on a piece of paper? When we will have an imperishable trace of those elusive melodies that memory no longer finds when it seeks them? Along with the letter were a number of rectangular strips of black paper covered in fine white lines. The American researcher brought one of these strips of paper back to his laboratory in Berkeley, had a virtual stylus play back the inscription, and out came the voice of a little girl. The first recording ever of the human voice. A voice from before what was once believed to be the absolute limit of audible history. The trouble is that Martinville never intended for the voice of his daughter to be played back by a machine. His apparatus wasn't designed to bring voices back into the air. All he wanted was to create a visual inscription that if studied long enough would be able to set off voices that would reverberate not in the outside air, but inside the head of the reader. He called it living speech. Our previous forms of writing is nothing but dead speech. I'm sure you can all hear the echo of the famous words written by St. Paul in the New Testament. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. St. Paul explains that the spirit, the living word, can never be inscribed onto any tablets of stone or any other material for that matter. The spirit can only be inscribed on tablets of flesh in the heart of mankind. Paul's law for living speech remained uncontested for 1,800 years until Martinville managed to inscribe the living spirit of his daughter onto a piece of paper or more correctly, until 148 years further on, when someone in 2008 found a way to release that spirit into the air again. Though this is not entirely true, in 2009 it was discovered that the researcher who brought the voice back to life had picked the wrong playback speed. For the true voice to appear, we have to slow down the recording to half the speed.
This is no little girl anymore. It is the voice of a full-grown man. It is Martin Will, the inventor himself, who sings. It is not known whether Martin Will ever had any daughter. is the name of the protagonist in Stanley Kubrick's film 2001, A Space Odyssey. An artificial intelligence installed in the spacecraft Discovery aimed for Jupiter in the year 2001. If the voice of Martin Will's non-existent daughter is the first recorded voice ever, then Hal's voice must be the last one. The recorded voice brought to its full potential. It calls forth from every corner of the spacecraft like the voice of a god, impossible to localize, like the voice inside the head, impossible to escape. Good evening, Dave. Hello, Tom. Everything's running smoothly, and you? Well, not too bad. Have you been doing some more work? A few sketches. May I see them? Sure. That's a very nice rendering, Dave. I think you've improved a great deal. Hal's voice is both calm and tense at the same time. It's the voice of a technology whose subservience and eagerness to please is driven by a hunger to extend its own dominion. When Hal is threatened by his human fellow travelers, he suddenly starts killing them one after the other. Until Dave, the last living remaining astronaut, forces his way into the memory center of the, of the ship and starts removing the circuits of Hal's memory, one after the other. My mind is going. There is no question about it. At the very end, we are brought back to the beginning of this voice. Here, let's switch to the French version. La chanson s'appelle Au clair de la lune. Au clair de la lune, mon ami first and last utterance in the French version of 2001 is the same song sung in the recording of Martin Will. Both voices, Hals and Martin Will's, also perform exactly the same glissando. A high-strung, high-strung, insistent voice is 
gradually slow down into a deep, sleepy and harmless one. And by now it should be clear to you that 2001, A Space Odyssey, is indeed a premonition of the future. But what a strange premonition. Hal thinks in the year 2001, in a vision Stanley Kubrick had of the future 33 years earlier when, they made the, when he made the movie. But Kubrick's vision, translated into French, is not a prophecy of that future, but of a future 40 years later when someone will unearth a recording from 148 years earlier. A recording of the voice of a girl who, 149 years later, is discovered never to have existed in the first place. All this seems a bit unnecessary. An extremely complicated trajectory, forwards and backwards through time, results in something that blows itself up into thin air in the end. But then again, it was only air in the first place. Air released by the lungs of a French typographer who once sang a song but who never intended for that moment of solitary singing to be brought back to life again in any other time and place in the shape of the voice of a daughter he never had. There is one last fact that further reinforces the claim that 2001, a space odyssey, in its very precise way of, very precise way of foretelling the future, is a truer vision than ever the writings of St. Paul. Hal does not remain a computer up to the very end. When enough circuits are cut, he suddenly transforms into something else. If you cut the electricity of a computer, it simply stops talking. If Hal is a computer, then why does his voice slow down? Why does his intonation sink into a senseless mumble? At the core of Hal must be an older technology. A technology who groans and whimpers and gradually loses speech as the life force ebbs out of it. A gramophone, a phonograph, or a phonograph. Inscriptions in matter turn into living and dying voices.